Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. Thank you all for tuning into the show today. What a great show. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking with Robert Bouval about his new book, The Soul of Ancient Egypt. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Well, I'm so excited to have Robert back on the show to talk about his book, but let me tell you a little bit about him, and we'll get him on the air. Egyptian-born Robert Bouval began studying ancient Egypt and the Giza pyramids in 1983. The acclaimed discoverer of the Orion Constellation Theory, he is the author of several books, including Black Genesis, Breaking the Mirror of Heaven, The Vatican Heresy, and the bestsellers The Orion Mystery and Message of the Sphinx. His discoveries have been the subject of several major TV documentaries on BBC, ABC, NBC, the Discovery Channel, and the History Channel. So please welcome Robert Boval. Hey, Robert, how are you? Hi, Rita. It's always a pleasure being on your show. I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I love having you on the show because you, oh, you know, I was talking about you to someone recently and I said, Robert is the best storyteller. And I could just sit there and listen to him. You know, I bet in a past life that you were probably a bard or some kind of storyteller because you, you have that nature about yourself. That's just, you know, part of you. Mm, should say this to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> I, uh, before you start, I'd like to say this. Um, today, because I live in Spain, as you know, and today is Spanish National Day. And uh, I didn't know this, but um, they selected the, the 12th of October because it's the day that Christopher Columbus sailed off to discover America. So mm -hmm. there you are. There's a kind of link. You should be celebrating too in the States. Well, you know, they they don't have Columbus Day as a national holiday anymore. I mean, it is, but it isn't. And a lot of states in the United States are changing it to uh, National Indigenous Day. I mean, there's, there's a controversy around the whole Columbus thing. So we'll see how that all pans out well here in spain as you can imagine it's it's a big deal mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh <clears throat> although I'm, I'm not going out today but uh the whole country sort of has a big fiesta they all go and dance in the street and the women dress up in flamingo and with guitars playing so it, it's uh, especially where i live i live on the costa del sol which is the andalusian uh, province mm -hmm. very very lively anyway let's get on okay <laughs> Robert, you have written numerous books on Egypt, but I want to know where I want to start with you is why Egypt? And not for you, why Egypt? Um, you know, other than the area being this small strip of luscious earth, um, you know, the rest of it is desert. Why did people start to inhabit this country and decide to create a civilization there? The answer is just 
one word, the Nile. I mean, uh, <clears throat> were it not for the Nile, the river Nile, Egypt, uh, as you just pointed out, would be uh, just a desert. Uh, it's the Nile that has made Egypt, and still does. Uh, as you know, it flows from Central Africa, from the highlands of Ethiopia, and, uh, and the swamps of uh, Uganda, the lakes, the great lakes of Victoria and uh, Tanganyika, and feeds this, this amazing river. By the way, it's the longest river in the world. I know a lot of people say the Mississippi, but it isn't. And uh, it, it's, it's without, without this uh, sacred river, because that's how the Egyptians saw it. And uh, it's the river that stimulated uh, the Egyptians to develop civilization very early because it has that rhythm. Uh, one of the mysteries of the river is not just it's, it's uh, the, the Egyptians are totally mystified where the water came from. In fact, we didn't know uh, even in modern times until, uh, let me get this right, 1886 when the, when the source of the Nile was uh, were discovered by the British. So they were totally mystified as to how come there's this river in, <laughs> coming from, from far away uh, through the desert. But what really got them uh, totally mystified and, and intrigued and looking for a, for a cosmic answer is the annual flood. The river would flood every year, uh, almost religiously, in, uh, in high midsummer. So at a time when you're, you would expect the river to to ebb for the water to get lower at, at, at the full heat of summer, it did the opposite. It would rise and, and flood the banks and irrigate the land. So because of this, and because they noticed that it would occur around the summer solstice, and uh, as you know, there are, I don't want to go through all this because it's not part of our discussion today, but they noticed that certain star groups like Orion and, and the star Sirius would rise at dawn uh, when the Nile would flood. So all this stimulated them to develop a, I suppose what one would call a cosmology today, uh, a sort of sacred sky religion, which uh, led very quickly to, uh, to the civilization developing very early. But there is something else. You'll have to interrupt me if you want to, if you want to move somewhere. Right? Because I can go on. You said I'm a storyteller. I can go on for a long time if you don't stop me. Rita? Yep, I'm still here. No, continue. Well, continue. I think this should be said. I've said it many times, but let me say it again. That uh, the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, uh, were absolutely convinced. Uh, this is something interesting that I'm working on at the moment with a, with, on a new book that I will start in a few months with a cosmologist. Uh, very famous cosmologist, actually an astrobiologist, a fellow called uh, Dr. Chandra Vikramasinghe. You might ask me this during the course of the of our interview because that's very interesting because we're looking into the cosmology of ancient cultures, but particularly ancient Egypt, because they arrived at the same conclusion that modern cosmologists have arrived now, that we well, actually come from the stars. And, we're trying and, to and I love that part because it's not even just Egypt that we find this advanced knowledge and, you know, advanced construction techniques, which we all are familiar with, but this advanced uh, knowledge of physics and cosmology that somehow we have forgotten. Yes, what we're going to look at is something that uh, is very intriguing. Uh, because I'm exploring this with a scientist, who was a cosmologist and astrobiologist. Uh, I was amazed that he has come to a conclusion that I've thought about for a long time, is that we may, we, I mean, as humans, uh, may have hardwired within us all the knowledge of the cosmos. We are literally a walking cosmos. We're made of the same stuff. We originated... Uh, from the same source, uh, every cell, every atom, every part of your your physical uh, self is is a cosmos. So the question arises whether the ancients were able to tap into what I 
as I'm metaphorically calling the, the, the black box, that, that place where we are unable to do it because we're using external science. Mm -hmm. and they, they were forced to, because they didn't have the science we have, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the, the science. And it may be, it's a big question, but it may be that the ancient Egyptians were able to tap through another means of accessing this knowledge, probably through initiation, some form of initiation. And I've been very, well, I, I won't say convinced, but I've been speculating all my life that the pyramids are part of this, this system, that the kind of hardware of a science, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of metaphysical science, to be able to tap into this, this, this uh, knowledge of everything. So having said this, uh, <clears throat> one of the things, coming back to the book that we should be talking about, The Soul of Ancient, ancient Okay, Egypt. but I have to tell you, Robert, I'm excited about that, but because I have a, you and I should have a talk offline about that, because I have a lot of, that's one of the areas that I've been studying for a long time, so we can talk. I might have sure. some good input for you, or at least yeah. pointers. Anyway, okay, so um, today we're, we're talking about your new book, um, The Soul of Ancient Egypt. Um, but you know, what I think is interesting is when we look at Egypt, we only, in the West, I mean, I'm not sure how they, they look at it in Europe, but in the West, we only dream of the historic Egypt and the dynastic Egypt. But I would think that, one, it's changed over time um, and evolved, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, by the way, we're in the West, too, in Europe. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> but you're a lot closer, and, you know, and the thought yeah. process might be Yes, different. okay, well, let, what this book is about, first of all, I should say that it's co-authored with uh, the Egyptian journalist Ahmed Osman, who is particularly well known for his books on the uh, moses Akhenaten connections. Uh, Ahmed and I were born in Egypt. He's a, a bit older than I. Uh, but we were both born in the time when Egypt was a kingdom, in the days of King Farouk. Uh, and uh, we were there as, uh, as, uh, as children when Egypt uh, had its first revolution and ousted the king. Uh, I uh, stayed in Egypt till I was nearly 20. So I went through the whole changes, modern changes, the, the, the revolution, the first revolution, the socialist period, the establishment of a republic. Uh, but then, uh, Ahmed and I have, Ahmed lives in London, by the way, he lives in England. Um, you may find this interesting, Ahmed, as a young man, uh, was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's a Muslim. Uh, he, op he, he opted out once he realized who they really were. And, uh, but that's very interesting because I'm a Christian by background, although I don't practice uh, Christianity. But this makes our combination very interesting because that's what Egypt is today. It is a, uh, a Muslim, predominantly Muslim country, but with a very large Coptic or Christian population. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do, and I hope we've managed to do it in this book, is that after the... Uh, uh, revolution of 2011 and all the confusion that uh, that uh, has arisen since then uh, the the taking of power for, by the Muslim Brotherhood then the, the army taking over again uh, the big question that uh, we heard all the time by intellectuals in Egypt was who are the Egyptians <laughs> I mean that's one of the funny things. The Egyptians don't know today what is an Egyptian. I mean, is he an Arab? Is he a Muslim? Is he, is he what? Is he an African? So we decided to go through the whole historical landscape, uh, starting from prehistory, uh, moving fast where we thought we should move fast, because we didn't, if, if you read, the, uh, perhaps I'll ask you to read the first uh, uh, paragraph of the book, which which very very concisely explains that our intention was not to write an historical book, or at least not in the classical manner. What we wanted to do was to search for the soul of Egypt, the soul that 
Egypt has lost, or, or, or that it has gone dormant. Uh, that ancient soul, that soul of Pharaonic Egypt. And this is uh, the task that we set ourselves. So we, we move fast when we think we should move fast, we slow down when we think we should slow down. For example, when we... <clears throat> let me set the chronology very, very quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, as, uh, taking the classical chronology, uh, although, as you know, I believe that it's much older, but taking the classical chronology, uh, Egyptian civilization kicked off about 5,000 years ago. Uh, and for 3,000 years, it was what today we would call a pharaonic civilization. You know, what people imagine in the West, like you say, particularly in America, when they conjure Egypt, they think of pyramids and temples and the Nile and pharaohs and, and Cleopatra and all this stuff. But for 3,000 years, that's what it was. But then, uh, in the uh, last century, well, in the last four centuries of, our, of, of the pre-Christian era, it was occupied by the Persians for about 200 years. Then Alexander the Great, the Greeks, the Macedonians, uh, occupied Egypt and became rulers of Egypt, the so-called Ptolemaic period, uh, for 300 years, till the death of Cleopatra in, in 30 BC. And then came the Romans. And the Romans held Egypt for 700 years. And when Rome became a Christian state, Egypt was Christianized. So for nearly 500 years, Egypt was a Christian country. Well, let, the, me, the, let me ask you one quick question here. So for this period between... Uh, the pharaonic rule, and then the period where Egypt was Christianized, what did people, what was the basic belief system there? Did they become, you know, disciples of Greek tradition? Were they still following the ancient Egyptian religious system? What was going on during this kind of no man's period? Yeah, let, let me finish the chronology, and then I'll okay, go no. into the belief systems, because okay. that's, you're absolutely right, this is what this book really is about. Uh, well, moving fast, uh, the Roman uh, held Egypt till the 7th century and then came in the Arabs from Saudi Arabia, the Muslim occupation, the Arab occupation of Egypt, and it's been under Arab rule, more or less because there's been some pockets of uh, changes uh, over the last 1500 uh, years, 1500 years, what am I saying? Of Muslim occupation uh, and that's what Egypt finally is today except that as uh, as Ahmed Osman and I have experienced ourselves it became a colonial uh, state under the British in the 19th century and then the revolution it became a kingdom a modern kingdom then it became a socialist country under a republic and now we have well we're not quite sure what we have a sort of military junta. So the question that really is, is today, if you are in Egypt and you're an Egyptian, you know, you, you really don't know what your identity is. You know, uh, are you supposed to think yourself as, as the, uh, the end of a pharaonic era? What? And this is what we wanted to explore. And then we come now to the belief systems, the ideologies, because for 3,000 years, under the pharaonic rule, Egypt was under a system of, I, I don't like to call it a religion, because the, Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians did not have a religion. You, you keep hearing about the ancient Egyptian religion, but they didn't have a word for religion. The nearest word that comes to what they had was magic. They called it hika. And this magical, or let's call it a magical religion, was based on a system that they call the mat, the cosmic law. In other words, that they're sort of Ten Commandments, if you like. They had 42 of them. And this was, to them, not a secular, like we have, you know, that Moses went up and sort of came down with tablets. They believed that this was dictated by the sky. And the sky had set a law, a, 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 a rhythm, if you like, that the country had to follow. In other words, what was happening in the sky was transferred on the ground. You know, the, 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 the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. So their country was 
perceived as a, as a cosmic land in rhythm with the, uh, with, the, with the rhythm of the sky, with the, with the precision of the sky, hence their monuments, why they align their monuments to the rising sun and the rising of stars and so forth. And their whole existence, uh, especially the pharaoh, the pharaoh followed the rhythm of what happened in the sky. He had what today we would call astrologers that would tell him what he had to do in accordance with what happened in the sky. Uh, and of course, the great rebirth rituals that mimicked the, 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 the rebirth of stars. So this is what Egypt was, and it was in perfect harmony with the cosmos. In fact, later on, the Greeks, when they occupied Egypt, used the word cosmopolitan. It was <laughs> still used in Alexandria when I was born. I, I never referred to myself as an Egyptian. When I lived in Alexandria, I refer to myself as a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the cosmos, citizen of the universe. So, to me, that, that's a, an amazing model. You know, how f fantastic it would be if we kind of get people thinking in those terms again. You know, Do you think that that's why Egypt lasted for 3,000 years with such a authority and power in the region? Because Absolutely. they were just very solid that way. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, you know, this is one thing. You know, let, let me speak how cosmologists would, would would speak about our presence here. I mean, you know, you 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 said you were in Texas and I'm in Spain. In fact, we're on a on a planet. You know, it is it is humans who have sort of split this planet into parts, if you like, and, and call this America, and call this uh, Asia, and call this Africa, and, and so forth. But we're on a planet. And this planet is part of a solar system. And this solar system is part of a galaxy. And this galaxy is part of a huge cosmos with billions and billions and billions of galaxies. You know, so... That's how a cosmologist thinks, and it seems that this is how the ancient Egyptians thought. So they didn't relate themselves solely to their, their, their direct environment. When an Egyptian, I would imagine, because of course I wasn't there <laughs> at that time, but when you read their texts and you look at their monuments as, as, and study their monuments as much as I have, you begin to realize that they perceive themselves as such. You know, they, they, and I'm, I'm thinking very much like them these days. You know, I've been immersed in their religion for 30 years. Uh, as you know, I, I've lived in Egypt for uh, on and off for 30 years. I've, I've been in their temples, their pyramids, you know. So all this has affected my way of thinking. I, I don't think myself as, as, as being a citizen of Belgium, a Belgian national, by the way. Uh, or uh, having been born in, uh, in Egypt and living in Spain, I see myself as they did, as a cos cosmopolitan. And that's what we're trying to do in this book, is to go through the whole landscape of how this was changed. Because, of course, when, when the Greeks came... Now, surprisingly, the Greeks did not want to change ancient Egypt. In fact, they changed. They, they adopted the ancient Egyptian religion, uh, they were more, in fact, more into it than the Egyptians themselves. I mean, all these wonderful temples that you see today, uh, the, the Temple of Isis in Phila, the Temple of uh, Edfu, the Temple of Horus in Edfu, and various others, are from the Ptolemaic period, the Greek period. And uh, Cleopatra, I mean, uh, everybody knows Cleopatra, she, she truly believed that she was an incarnated Isis, like all queens of Egypt. And her spouse, if you like, was the incarnated Osiris. That's how uh, the Horus, the living king, the living Horus king. So that's how they saw themselves. And <clears throat> having said this, this, this wonderful, harmonious, cosmopolitan, perfectly in harmony with the cosmos, with the, with the rhythm of the Nile, with the sacredness of their land, I mean, everything was sacred to them, was suddenly disrupted when the Romans came. Well, I was just what I was just thinking was it's very interesting because what I have seen when you look at cultures and they start to, I'm going to say, advance culturally, advance technologically, 
that connection to their origin, to source, to the magic. I'll use that's a great word. To the magic tends to dwindle and fall apart. Um, but it sounds like in this culture, they held on to it and it well into the relatively modern era. Well, they held on to almost to the 30 years before the birth of Christ. 